Hello and welcome to our third party roundup webinar with Sixth Sense. Today, we have our industry expert, John Cassell, here to give us an inside look into the most recent third party updates. If you have any questions, please add them to the chat and John will reach out after to answer those. And with that, I'll hand things over to John Cassell. All right. Hey, everyone. Thank you for attending this month's uh, third party roundup webcast. Today, I'll be covering some of the most popular third party uh, applications that have received updates since last month's webcast in February. There have also been a number of security bulletins and advisories throughout the month, and as well as multiple version uh, updates across various products, and sadly, including some zero day advisories, which we'll cover. Um, as a background on application content, for most third party applications, the timing of their availability from vendors is often uncertain. Unlike Microsoft, uh, which is adhered to a consistent release schedule on the second Tuesday of each month uh, for well over a decade, I think we're going on two decades now at least, um, many manufacturers lack a guaranteed cadence. However, some of them like uh, Adobe, which we'll talk about today, have eventually adopted similar schedules. Uh, I conduct this webcast on the, typically, I should say, on the last Tuesday of each month to ensure coverage of most releases. If you tune in next month, by the way, with Memorial Day, I'll be covering it on the uh, on Wednesday instead. So a little bit different next month. Um, that's our general cadence. Let's also briefly differentiate between a vulnerability and, um, and a patch or uh, an update. Uh, a vulnerability it refers to a flaw or misconfiguration within a product, application, or an operating system that, if exploited, could allow attackers to compromise said system. Conversely, a patch or an, <clears throat> sorry, a patch or an update is a uh, software release provided by the vendor to address such vulnerabilities. It's also very important to note that not all vulnerabilities can be patched, and not all patches resolve vulnerabilities. Most updates, uh, when they get released, are simply optional in nature. Uh, there's really no security rating to them. Um, there might be something underlying, but nothing has been disclosed. And I'm just going to say it like that. <laughs> if a vulnerability um, is disclosed without an actual available patch or workaround, then it is considered a zero-day exploit. And uh, in case you're not sure, um, I kind of go through this as a precursor for everyone since we're going to be using a lot more, um, say, technical terms going forward. Uh, zero-day vulnerability is one that is actively exploited by attackers. Uh, before uh, the vendor has had a chance to develop or distribute a patch. Essentially, uh, it's an attack that occurs on the same day that the vulnerability is discovered, leaving zero days for the vendor to respond. This makes zero-day exploits particularly dangerous as systems are left vulnerable to attacks with no immediate solution available. But before delving into the latest updates since the month began, let's discuss how we prioritize them. At Sixth Sense, uh, we focus on six key factors, Firstly, we consider uh, the vendor severity, which ranges from critical severity typically to non-applicable or, or NA or optional, um, and is provided directly by the update manufacturer themselves. While it's crucial to check their advisory, it's um, also worth noting that this rating can clearly be biased. Uh, many third-party updates don't receive severity up, uh, ratings rather from manufacturers, and I'm just gonna say probably to avoid highlighting their product or application negatively, um, which is a big, of course, uh, important term. We're looking at accountability and disclosure, and as well as some shifts we have actually seen here in the US from our administration, uh, pushing more towards accountability for manufacturers. Uh, this might change in the future, and we have actually seen a few changes from manufacturers disclosing more information. We'll talk a little bit more about that today. However, uh, historically, we've addressed this by prioritizing instead the industry severity such as the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, calculated by an independent organization, such as NIST, and leveraging the National Vulnerability Database. The score ranges from zero to 10, with higher ratings indicating a higher likelihood of exploitation. Next, we assess the state of the vulnerability, particularly uh, if it's weaponized, uh, meaning that it's actively being exploited in the wild, posing an immediate risk to individuals and environments through sophisticated attacks. When vulnerabilities are publicly disclosed, uh, that means that the bug's details have been exposed to the industry. Uh, while this doesn't necessarily mean active exploitation, it signifies essentially a precursor uh, that information needed to weaponize the vulnerability is available, uh, often through bug bounty programs, independent researchers, or the manufacturer. 
Uh, it's not the exact same risk, but it's uh, just before that, essentially. It's what can lead into, of course, active exploitation, so it is of high concern. Countermeasures are essential uh, and come in two forms, such as mitigations, uh, such as a configuration from an antivirus or EDR solution that halts the vulnerabilities exploitation without requiring an urgent patch deployment. So it's really just shutting down the actual exploit. And then there are also workarounds such as registry changes or policy adjustments, which are more preventative um, to ensure that the configuration is not, well, exploitable. For instance, Microsoft may provide recommended policy or registry changes instead of an out-of-band update. And we typically see this year after year when it comes to Windows Server uh, operating systems where there may not be a patch, uh, or there might be a patch as well, but further uh, recommendations would be to apply settings to the specific server roles. Lastly, we consider exposure, which is based on the tool or solution used to detect and report uh, on outstanding vulnerabilities across the device fleet. Uh, I'll just say that, of course, every environment's unique with different tools, different solutions, leveraging different manufacturers, and of course, various operating systems. And the main topic today, again, various applications. Understanding the vulnerability landscape helps us efficiently target those endpoints for remediation. So when we consider the first five factors in a way our base score, we want to apply that against, of course, where it actually applies to the environment, or where it's actually detected, rather. So we might have a number of critical updates available to us to detect, but if it doesn't apply to us, well, then they're not all that critical. Just means that there are items out there that could plague us, but they're not actively an issue. Uh, so what is actually, of course, being detected, even if they're lower severity issues, should still be prioritized. So jumping into it, the third party uh, products we'll be discussing today, again, have all received updates since last month and all res uh, resolved some sort of vulnerability. Most products I discuss on this webcast have had some sort of advisory. They're not just updates and optionals. I usually kind of just mention those at the very end, but rather prioritizing where we actually see CVEs and especially if those CVEs have actually been um, targeted. Um, and as well, I do look to the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, Although, unfortunately, not a doc on them, but I didn't notice the advisory for every single issue that I, um, <clears throat> I'm going to raise today. So I might be tabling that for the next few webcasts, um, as some of the information I saw in their advisories were lacking, sadly. Uh, jumping into the first manufacturer, Adobe. <clears throat> Adobe Experience Manager actually took the cake with most uh, uh, fixes across all of the products that they uh, patched. Uh, 45 security fixes to Experience Manager. 42 are important. Sorry, I lose my voice today. 42 are important with 5.4 CVSS scores, which is, of course, lower, uh, more on the moderate side, I would say, and three important with lower scores from there. Most of the important issues are related to cross-site scripting, which, if exploited, could lead to arbitrary code execution, as well as there were a couple improper input validation issues that could also lead to security feature bypass. Uh, Experience Manager is, however, cloud-based or cloud-hosted rather from Adobe, so no patches actually need to be prioritized. Uh, and if you're using it, you should have already realized that latest version. Adobe Premiere Pro received an update for Windows and Mac OS devices with two critical security fixes, both with CVSS scores of 7.8. Remember, that falls out of uh, uh, 0 through 10, so the closer towards 10, the higher the score. Uh, this version includes fixes for heap-based buffer overflow and out-of-bounds write that, if either were exploited, could again lead to arbitrary code execution. Adobe Cold Fusion is the next one, receiving an update to address a single critical improper access control issue that, if exploited, could actually lead to arbitrary file system read. Uh, and this vulnerability has a CVSS base score of 8.2. Uh, when we get into 9 uh, and above, that's where I would actually deem it as a critical classification. Um, so as much as they actually subjectively say that this is critical, it is very important, but I wouldn't really classify it as critical just yet. It's pretty much um, on that threshold between high and critical. Uh, Adobe Bridge received an update as well for Windows and Mac OS devices with four security fixes, three of them rated critical and a single important out of bounds read issue. The critical issues include use after free, heap based buffer overflow and out of bounds write with CVSS scores ranging from 7.8 to 8.6, raising concerns for that product. 8.6 is again, getting into that threshold into critical. Adobe Lightroom received an update for only Mac OS devices, bringing Lightroom to version 7.2. Uh, 
uh, there was a single critical vulnerability related to untrusted search path that if exploited could as well lead to arbitrary code execution. Adobe, however, didn't post the CVSS score on their advisory, but after reconciling the CVE with the National uh, Vulnerability Database, that had a CVSS score of 7.5, making it as well a higher concern. Lastly, Adobe Animate received an update again for Windows and Mac OS devices, so it might affect the fleet that's within your control, or devices rather in your fleet. Uh, four security fixes, one rated as critical with three important out-of-bounds read issues. The single critical is related to out-of-bounds write, and again has a CVSS score of 7.8. It's also worth noting that Adobe does provide a vendor priority along with all of their security bulletins. Um, and all products mentioned earlier have received a normal priority of three. Since their priority rating of lower is more concerning, this means that the products, according to the manufacturer, are not at elevated risk of being exploited. Typically, Adobe stamps their product updates with a priority of three, with lesser chance of being exploited, whereas an actively exploited product, or if bug details were published, uh, would receive a priority of one or potentially two. And I've seen where uh, it hasn't been exploited, but publicly disclosed, they did stamp that with two. So it's my assumption that if it did fall in those other categories, uh, that's uh, that's where they would fall into. Uh, Google Chrome has had four releases since our last webcast. Maybe five, we'll find out. Uh, once again, and for the seventh month in a row, Google dropped an update for Chrome on the day of our webcast last month on February 27th. So that's where we're going to go ahead and start. On the 27th, there were four total security issues. Two of them were disclosed by external researchers with a total of $14,000 total in bounties. Uh, both were rated at high, as high severity. The first issue is tracked to CVE 2024-1938 regarding a type confusion issue in the V8 JavaScript engine. It was reported on February 11th and garnered a $7,000 payout. Second is CVE 2024-1939 and there's another type confusion bug in V8, but is reported by another researcher from the Tencent Security Lab on February 5th, and it garnered another $7,000 payout, which is pretty nice. Usually I see them falling into like, well, either not applicable, there's no payout, or uh, or usually it's less than $5,000. So those are, those are more healthy uh, bounties. On March 5th, uh, there were three total security issues with high severity for all of them all disclosed by external researchers with a total of $25,000 total in, um, sorry, in bounties. First is tracked as CVE 2024-2173 regarding an out-of-bounds memory access issue, again in V8, and was reported on February 19th, as well as garnered a $12,000 payout. It's pretty nice. Second issue is tracked as CVE 2024-2174 and instead related to inappropriate implementation in V8. It was also reported on February 19th, and this had a bounty of $7,000. And the last issue in the release was tracked as CVE 2024-2176, um, and is related to uh, use after free in FedCM, uh, reported by Anonymous on February 20th, and this got Anonymous uh, $6,000. On March 12th, there were three total security fixes, with one reported by an external researcher, just going to cover the external researchers content didn't find much from uh, chrome beyond that uh, the single high severity fix is tracked to cve 2024 2400 and is regarding a user after free issue and performance manager it was reported by a user of the ant group security lab on march 1st and at this time there's no bug bounty it's still being determined so whoever you are hope you get a good payout on march 19th this brings version chrome to uh uh, to 123 for Windows, Mac, and Linux devices. There were 12 total security fixes, seven of which were disclosed by external researchers for a total of $22,000 in bounties. Out of the seven disclosed issues, one's rated high, five medium, and one low. We'll simply look at the uh, higher severity issues. The um, high severity is tracked to CVE 2024-2625. Uh, and is related to an object lifecycle issue again in V8. So that uh, JavaScript engine has uh, has noticed or realized quite a few vulnerabilities um, being solved within the last month. It was reported on March 1st. However, no bug bounty determined just yet. And then the medium severity issues, we'll just consolidate these actually, um, are uh, include an out-of-bounds read, 
uh, use after free in Canvas, inappropriate implementation issues, I see quite a few here, and incorrect security UI in iOS. Like every month, I'm going to double check Google Chrome's release notes just in case uh, another update dropped. Just my luck. Bear with me just a moment. Want to make sure that I get this as up to date as possible. I'll check it probably before the call ends. They'll probably drop an update in the next hour, and I'm going to miss it, but we'll cover it next month. Anywho, I like to bring this up when discussing Chrome every month um, since the last few years have been quite interesting. In 2021, uh, it was a tough year for Google as the browser had 16 zero-day exploits. In 2022, there were nine. 2023 included eight. And this year is off to a great start, I would, I would say, uh, with only one zero-day exploit back in January. Bear in mind that many other Chromium browsers uh, have received updates as well, such as Opera, Brave, and Microsoft Edge. We are going to dig a little deeper into Edge, as most of the information for this browser is um, is disclosed, and I, I appreciate from Microsoft supplying all the detail. But then, as well, its use is actually uh, pretty high. Uh, many people think that Edge is not common, but it's actually very commonly used. <clears throat> February 27th included um, a basic fix, nothing there to highlight. On the 29th, there are various bugs as well. However, there was an Edge-specific vulnerability. Again, they share common code with Chromium. But sometimes Edge has its own vulnerabilities. And in this case, it does. Track the CVE 2024-26196 related to Android information disclosure. So clearly, it's not affecting most endpoints out there only for using Android. Has a lower CVSS score of 4.3, requiring user interaction, but exploitation is less likely. And rather than repeating myself, every single Edge-specific uh, vulnerability we'll talk about today, exploitation is less likely. On March 1st, um, there was also another fix for various bugs. However, Microsoft detailed an extra note resolution of a network issue that prevented sites from loading within a Microsoft Defender uh, application guard window. On March 7th, more bugs were fixed, nothing to highlight, but there was improved reliability with fixing a browser crash, which occurred when the browsing data lifetime policy was enabled. On March 14th, there were additional fixes with three edge-specific vulnerabilities. Uh, these are all lower scores, so I'm just going to kind of zoom through these uh, for the sake of time. First is tracked as 2024-26167 related to Android spoofing. It has a lower score of 4.3, and attack uh, complexity is low. Second is tracked as CVE 2024-26163 related to security feature bypass. It also has a lower score of 4.7. And the third is tracked as CVE 2024 26246 and is also related to security feature bypass, as well with an even lower score of 3.9. So concerning, but not all that concerning. On the 21st, it was another uh, uh, build. Oh, this for specific uh, specific to extend uh, stable channel, uh, if you happen to be using it. And then, of course, shortly after, they do uh, their main feature release, which was on March 22nd, which did include a lot more. Two feature updates on the 22nd release. First, admins can customize their organization's branding assets onto Edge for business through the MS Edge management service. This helps users sign in with an Entra ID to more easily differentiate between multiple profiles and browser windows through visual cues on the profile pill, profile layout, and Edge for business taskbar icon. The second feature, they added automatic profile switching controls for MS Edge for business in the MS Edge management service. They also added a whopping 16 new policies, which I think is more than I've seen in the last year or two uh, for a single release, that's quite a bit. We usually don't see a feature release without a few Edge-specific vulnerabilities, and this one did have two. The first is CVE 2024-26247. Again, another security feature bypass vulnerability with a lower score of 4.7. And the other is 2024-29057, related to spoofing, and has a CVSS of 4.3. And again, all uh, edge-specific vulnerabilities uh, were flagged by Microsoft as being less likely to exploit. Mozilla uh, Firefox has had three releases since last month's webcast, which actually, given last month's cadence, I'm going to go ahead and just check again. <laughs> Checked it this morning, but anything can happen. No, no new releases. That's good. So yeah, three uh, um, up until now. 
On March 5th, uh, Firefox went to version 123.0.1 with minor fixes, nothing to highlight. March 19th brought Firefox to version 124 for main and extended release users. There were 12 security fixes, one critical, five high, five moderate, and one low severity. Security fixes include Windows Error Reporter being used as a sandbox escape vector, mishandling of register values, integer overflow, improper handling of HTML and body tags, and the typical high severity monthly memory safety bugs, of which one of the CVEs were tracked as 2024-2615, uh, sorry, 2615, and did actually have a critical severity, just the first time in about a year where I've seen that. This release also allows uh, carrot browsing mode in the PDF viewer. The Firefox view tab enhance, uh, there are Firefox view tab enhancements. Uh, fixes for the Windows taskbar to run more efficiently. Firefox on Mac now uses the Mac OS full screen API for all types of full screen windows, as well as uh, looks like new language availability when using the Quant search engine. On March 22nd, there was also another release. This is probably the most important. Even though it's a minor release to Firefox 124.0.1, this did resolve two critical vulnerabilities. The first was tracked to CVE 2024-29943, related to out-of-bounds access via range analysis bypass, where an attacker was able to perf uh, performance on out-of-bounds read or write on JavaScript object by fooling range-based bounds attacks check elimination. So I'm reading from their website. And the second issue is tracked to CVE 2024-29944, related to privileged uh, JavaScript execution via event handlers. An attacker was able to inject an event handler into a privileged object that would allow arbitrary JavaScript execution in the parent process. And this also only affects desktop Firefox. So that's a good thing. Both vulnerabilities were disclosed by Manfred Paul uh, via Trend Micro Zero Day Initiative. Great job. Um, that's it. Any updates to Firefox typically also include security fixes to Mozilla Thunderbird. And I already assessed Thunderbird. Looks like the release notes um, are pretty standard. The two latest critical advisories do not affect Thunderbird if you happen to be using it. Moving on, Snagit by TechSmith received an interesting update to Snagit 2024 um, to update a Wix vulnerability tracked as CVE 2024-24810, where a local attacker could elevate privileges when the Snagit installer is running. NIST assigned it a CVSS of 7.8. Eight. GitHub assigned it a CVSS of 8.2, and it may actually affect other third-party applications. However, um, I did do some searching, and I wasn't able to find that documented in any other vendor offerings, which, again, could be sometimes a concern, but I did not see that leveraged or stipulated, rather disclosed by anybody else. If you happen to use Snagit, uh, you might also enjoy hearing that this version also introduces a purchasing all right, let's see, they wrote it, purchasing a, a software license as a subscription, enabling a lower initial cost for users. Some additional uh, products have also seen updates since the start of the month, and these include Amazon Workspaces. I have a few more that are not on the slide. Amazon Workspaces, Bitwarden, various Cisco products, of course, including WebEx, Citrix Workspace, Dropbox, Foxit Reader, Genesis Cloud, Google Drive, Jenkins, Malwarebytes, Power BI, Ring Central, Skype, Slack, Team Viewer, WinRare, WinSCP, and Zoom. And then uh, this webinar would not be complete uh, without the Apple security updates. Although, of course, I know they are not considered third party. I uh, just uh, definitely want to cover them uh, because, uh, well, don't want it to go unnoticed or unsaid. It has actually been a difficult month as well for Apple products as there were actually 18 separate advisories between March 5th and March 25th. In total, between 12 separate product lines, there were 265 CVEs with two specific zero-day exploits plaguing eight separate products. The first zero-day is tracked as uh, CVE 2024-23225, where an attacker with arbitrary kernel read and write uh, capability may be able to bypass kernel memory protections. A memory corruption issue was addressed with input, uh, sorry, improved validation as well as Apple stated again that they're aware of a report, it may have been exploited in the wild. The second zero day is tracked as 2024-23296 related to RT kit, 
where an attacker with arbitrary kernel read and write capability may again be able to attack, um, again, bypass, sorry, kernel memory protections. It was as well uh, fixed with improved validation. And once again, Apple stated there wherever report that it may have been exploited. Um, overall, the zero day issues affect the following iOS and iPad OS version 16 and 17, Vision OS, well, version 1, TV OS uh, 17, Watch OS 10, Mac OS Monterey, Ventura, and Sonoma. Oh, and then as well, uh, iP iOS and iPad OS version 16, as well as Mac OS Monterey and Ventura were actually affected by the kernel vulnerabilities, uh, not the RT kit vulnerability. Other products that as well received standard updates uh, in this last month include iOS and iPadOS version 15, Xcode 15, Safari 17, GarageBand 10, with additional updates for Vision OS, newer iOS and iPadOS versions, and Mac OS Ventura and Sonoma. Um, Sonoma, I just threw it on the screen here, did have 68 total fixes in one of those advisories. That's quite a bit. So. Uh, it's to be expected. It's a newer operating system. So, um, of course, disclosing that information and, of course, hardening the operating system is most desired. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. That's how, of course, we improve security. I know, again, Apple doesn't really count as a third-party product, but I like covering it on this webcast just to inform my Apple audience, and especially with the zero-day exploits this month. Uh, and, of course, for any other third-party products on Apple devices, be sure to check your app store and update accordingly. I hope that this has been informative and useful to everybody. Uh, and if you enjoy the form of this webcast or not, please contact us, let us know. Every day, um, the Six Sense team identifies, classifies, and pre-checks various patches and vulnerabilities that affect common endpoints and servers. To get a full listing of all the various issues that may impact your environment, be sure to check our website under resources. You'll get a link to the vulnerability database. What I love about the vulnerability library is it doesn't just discuss the level of impact like everyone else, but we publicly offer rep recommendations and resolutions to all issues, including vendor links to download the latest patch in case say, you don't have our product, that's fine. If you have any further questions, concerns, or please suggestions for improvement, we would love to hear it. Thank you for your time and happy patching.